Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for August 8th, uh, 2022. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. I, I entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Shamos, seconded by Councilmember Sterner. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the agenda is approved. Next, we're on to approval of the July 25th, 22. Transportation Committee me meeting minutes. Did anyone have any changes or additions to the minutes? Councilmember Sterner. Yeah, I just was wondering. I, I missed the meeting, and I was uh, in New York, and I and I did call in that I wasn't, but I didn't call transportation. So I don't know if there's a way to get it excused or how that works. I, I don't miss too many meetings, so I wasn't sure about the procedure of that. Yeah. Is it? I guess I just have a message on there. Can change it. We'll make sure it's yeah. noted. Okay. All right. All right. Um, all right. With that um, change in mind, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Sterner. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Cummings. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the minutes are approved. Next, we're on to MTS Director uh, reports. And we have Amy Venowet here tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Just a couple items for today. First, uh, you should have all received an invitation to the Travel Demand Management or TDM workshops. Um, those are occurring tomorrow from 3 to 6, and the second is on Wednesday from 9 to noon. If you're still interested in attending, you can talk to me after this meeting, and I'll help you get registered. Um, Secondly, you'll remember that last spring, we had a pilot testing of the transit onboard survey where we did 4,000 surveys on our busiest transit routes. And this fall, actually this week, the full survey is kicking off and we will be starting an interview of 16,000 riders. The surveys are done on Metro Transit, MTS routes and all of the suburban transit provider routes and they will, as I said, start this week and go through late fall. And then we will be sharing the survey results with you in early 2023. And that is all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council members? Hmm. Council Member Chambliss. Is, is that um, just a onboard survey only or are you gonna post the questions or how does that work? Uh, um, Madam Chair and Member Chambliss, it is strictly on board, so it's an in-person survey, and we ask questions regarding purpose of the trip, um, other uses of transit, destinate origin and destination, and then demographic information. Any additional questions? All right, and we'll move next to Metro Transit General Manager Koistra. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh... I too will just have a couple of updates today. First, uh, I think it's important that I acknowledge last Tuesday's fatal shooting of the 15-year-old on the Nicollet Mall light rail platform. A 17-year-old has been charged in this homicide, and you know I think in every sense of the terms, uh, these, these are real, this is really true, tragic and, and senseless, and it affects us all who who uh, care about transit, work for transit, and care about our, our communities. But I do want to recognize the responding police officers who provided aid and who helped uh, locate the suspect less than a half hour from the time of the incident. And I also want to acknowledge the instrumental role uh, played by our real-time information center who quickly distributed Im images that really helped us uh, know where the suspect was and help in the, in the uh, eventual apprehension. But I also want to thank the great work of our bus operator who, after being alerted, uh, recognized the suspect was on his bus and then pulled over and notified police of their whereabouts. That's quite an act, and, and uh, I want to acknowledge that that work of our bus operator did everything he was supposed to do. And you can imagine uh, what was going through his mind at the time of, of doing it. So there's no good outcome in a situation like this, uh, but the response by our police department, our bus operator, and our local partners was really, truly commendable. It's all that we could have asked for them in this situation. I wanted to share that, that with you. Uh, second, uh, Councilmember Barber, with your permission, I'd like to turn the rest of my report over to Brian Funk uh, 
to introduce Metro Transit's new Deputy <coughs> Chief Operating Officer for Transportation. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, again, Brian Funk, uh, Chief Operating Officer here at Metro Transit, and I'm proud to introduce today uh, our new Deputy Chief Operating Officer for Transportation, uh, Michael Powell. Uh, he joins us from a 28-year career at New York City Transit, uh, started off as a bus operator uh, in Brooklyn, uh, served on the union side of the house for a number of years, uh, and then made a move over to supervision and management uh, in the early 2000s and worked uh, across the city on a number of their big initiatives, uh, wrapping up uh, his tenure at Staten Island um, in, in recent times. And so... Uh, we're happy to have him uh, join part of the team. He started last Monday. Uh, we've been doing introductions and kind of get to know yous uh, for the last week or so. We took a trip up to Big Lake to see North Star today. And so i um, trying to just provide that baseline orientation uh, for him as he joins the team. And just as a reminder, uh, back in January, uh, when I assumed my role, uh, the leadership team in operations and I made a little bit of a change to our structure. And so uh, Michael's uh, responsibility will be for all of the employees who are directly responsible for service delivery, which we call transportation. So uh, operators, whether they're operating buses or trains, supervisors, uh, training staff, management staff, all working towards that service delivery outcome. Uh, Matt Dake, who uh, you all have had the pleasure of meeting over the last four years, uh, is our deputy chief of maintenance, uh, overseeing all of bus uh, light rail and commuter rail maintenance activities. So uh, we're really excited about this time. Uh, we have a lot of challenges today and into the future, but I think we're assembling the right team and uh, marching forward. So thank you for the time. Anything you want to add? I'd like to extend my um, thanks to Metro Transit and the council in general uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, be here and hopefully uh, be an effective force and change and uh, boost up the morale and win the ridership back and, uh, you know, post COVID and, and really make some effective change uh, to benefit the whole city, uh, Twin City area. So thank you for having me. Welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you and welcome. It's really nice to have you here. And I guarantee you it's as beautiful outside like this every single day <laughs> in Minnesota. So you picked a very good time to move, but welcome. We're really, really glad to have you here. So. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions or comments from council members? Or either west or all right thank you guys thank you all right then we're on to um we actually don't have a tack for um, report from mr finley tonight he said he'll be back um the next time around so um we'll definitely hear from him then um moving on to consent business we have four items on consent tonight i'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent come on moved by council member gonzalez is there a second 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 by Council Member Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the items on consent are approved. We are on to our one business item for the evening, which is business item 2022-214, which is the Metro B Beeline Real Estate Acquisition and Condemnation Resolution. We have Luke Sandstrom here. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Luke Sandstrom. I'm a principal engineer in the Material BRT program. And tonight I'm presenting business item 2022 214. This proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council pass resolution 2022 21 declaring the Metro B Line project as a public purpose, authorizing acquisition of all real estate interests necessary for the project, and authorizing staff to initiate condemnation proceedings on behalf of the council for parcels that cannot be acquired by negotiation. Metro Transit will lead construction of the Metro B-Line project and Met Council's real estate office will lead acquisition efforts for the project. The project requires the acquisition of approximately 12 temporary and two permanent easements from parcels along the Metro B-Line corridor in the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul in order to implement the B-Line stations. There are no anticipated fee acquisitions or relocations associated with the project. Funding for acquisitions is available in the authorized Metro B-Line project capital budget. All reasonable efforts will be made to acquire property through direct purchase. However, in some circumstances, it may be necessary to use condemnation under Minnesota Statutes Chapter 117 to acquire the property. The statute requires that there be a public purpose for the use of condemnation. The attached resolution formally declares the Metro Beeline project as a public purpose and allows the real estate office to begin the process of easement acquisition. 
Construction for the B-Line will begin in spring of 2023 and will commence until B-Line opening at the end of 2024. All necessary easements will be acquired prior to construction beginning. So again, Madam Chair, committee members, the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council pass resolution 2022-21, declaring the Metro B-Line project as a public purpose, authorize acquisition of all real estate interests necessary for the project, and authorizing staff to initiate condemnation proceedings on behalf of the council for parcels that cannot be acquired by negotiation. With that, I'd stand for any questions or comments. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Council Member Sterner. Thank you. I just was wondering how many parcels are we talking about? What's the maximum number of parcels that are requested? So we're looking at about 14 parcels. 14. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions? Council Member Chambliss. Yeah, I just have a question. <coughs> um, for those temporary easements or um, those temporary acquisitions, can you tell me um, how that works? Is that like blocking off portions of the road temporarily? Um, can you give me some examples of those types of acquisitions? So Madam Chair, um, Committee Member Chambliss, so typically for our ABRT projects, our station platforms are constructed within the existing right-of-way, but we're typically tying into an existing sidewalk or a building face. And so the temporary easements, which is again, renting of the space, is usually just for grading purposes to tie in or replace existing sidewalk up into the right of way. And that's typically how we see them played out in our projects. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? All right, seeing the hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-214. So moved. Moved by Council Member Cummings. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Pacheco. Um, is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Um, we are, um, that is the end of our consent or our business for the evening, which um, is not the committee. So um, we'll enjoy that particular part. But I think all of our items, including the, the one business item, can go consent to the full council if everyone agrees. All right, very good. And we're on to our information item then. It's 2022 State Fair and Q3 Service Changes and Operating Hiring Update. We have Brian Funk and Adam Harrington. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. Uh, again, Brian Funk, Chief Operating Officer. Um, in today's presentation, we're going to provide an overview of uh, where we are right now with our bus and train operator staffing levels, I give you a state fair service preview, and then I'll turn it over to Adam uh, for information uh, covering our, those service changes in a little bit more detail. Uh, so right now, this is a, a story that this council has become familiar with. Uh, despite a lot of efforts, we have market forces that are challenging our ability to hire uh, enough bus operators. And so the line in green on this chart shows where we'd like to be. That reflects about 95% of our budgeted service uh, from the 2019 levels um, at just under 1,400 uh, total operators. Uh, you can see the red line uh, on the chart shows our actual, uh, which has been sort of in a gradual decline since the December 18th is the first date uh, shown in this chart, um, just kind of orienting you to each quarterly service change um, in June of 2020 is when we made the largest planned service changes uh, as a reflection of the early days of COVID. And uh, we started to bounce back and now we're finding ourselves at levels that are not much higher than some of those early days. Uh, yellow, the yellow line uh, shows our planned levels based on those service requirements. And so that's why when we talk about these numbers, there's really those three key numbers. Uh, there's the yellow and red, which is measuring today's outcomes, uh, how we're going to do against the service that we've promised our customers in each of those quarterly service changes. But really the green is that targeted level where we know we'd like to be uh, to be able to provide enough access for our customers uh, and ensure that we also have a high degree of reliability. Uh, you can see that in terms of total system hours, uh, in June of 2020, as I mentioned, we were at about 74%. That's when we had uh, less span of service, uh, less uh, express service, really heavily focused on core local service uh, following the state shutdown. And then we gradually ramped up and now we're coming back down. It's a little bit of a different distribution, but we still have a system that's largely focused on our core route network, 
uh, which Adam will explain in detail momentarily. Uh, this chart is meant to just illustrate uh, for everyone. It, it's also showing our bus operator staffing levels, but it's meant to illustrate that um, our challenges with having too few operators is not necessarily a new story. Uh, this is something that uh, our teams have been challenged on for years. Uh, we intentionally chose this to start uh, in March of 2011. And so that goes back quite a ways, uh, but something significant happened that summer um, and that was a state government shutdown. And so here at Transit, we did not interrupt our services. However, we had a period of time where we were not hiring uh, and uh, that caused us to fall behind. And so that's where you can see the diversion where the orange line, which is where uh, our actual numbers are, is too far below the blue, which is where we scheduled. And so uh, that story uh, has some peaks and valleys. Uh, the valleys on this chart are really the summertime uh, schedules when we have less service planned because the high schools are out and the University of Minnesota is out. Uh, but in the normal, the other three picks of the year, uh, we've been perpetually understaffed uh, for years, despite a lot of efforts and a lot of energy from staff to, to really remedy that. Uh, finally, the right side is just a, a different way of orienting you to what we showed earlier, where we had a, a major decrease in requirement for operators uh, early in the pandemic. Uh, we were overstaffed uh, for a while, but uh, because of both COVID leave and other needs, uh, we kept everyone on staff, but as we started to see that gradual decline, um, as you all recall, we started to jumpstart our hiring process very early in 2021. Uh, but we jumped into a new market. Uh, we jumped into a market that was a lot more selective. And today we find ourselves uh, locally with a 1.8% unemployment rate, uh, which is great for a lot of people uh, who are gainfully and fully employed. It's tough when you're uh, looking to recruit new staff uh, into an organization, even one uh, like ours that has competitive pay and exceptional benefits and a lot of career advancement opportunities. So we continue to work on our tried and true methods uh, but today we find ourselves uh, about 35 operators short of where we'd like to be uh, when we're looking at our full-time and our part-time weekday workforce. Uh, were those 35 operators short uh, with just eight uh, people in our training center? And sadly, I was hoping to come in today and be able to describe a full class of people starting new in our instruction center. And today we were not able to start a class. Uh, we had a really nice uh, bump of interest during the rodeo event that uh, some, of, some of you came and, and helped with, and I know certainly uh, have been cheerleaders for us, but uh, the, that is really not uh, materializing in new starts uh, quite yet. But I can tell you our staff is continuing to stick with it. Uh, we're energized to make the most of uh, the folks we do have. We have our apprenticeship program still going strong uh, and really looking to you know, make sure that everyone coming in the door has, has a really good opportunity to start a fantastic career like many of us have had. Um, and then real quickly, I'll touch on the state fair. This has been mentioned at previous uh, general manager updates, uh, but the 2022 state fair is gonna look a lot like the 2021 state fair from Metro Transit's perspective. Uh, we are gonna continue to operate from just three sites um, and about every 30 minute frequency. Uh, now, at the beginning of the day, when we know that there's more people who are planning to go, uh, we'll do our best to have resources so that we're able to run buses as soon as they're full. But our, our promise to our customers is that a bus will be there at least every 30 minutes. Uh, we're confident about this. Last year was a really odd year, and we're a little bit unsure of what to expect, other than it does seem that more people are out at uh, normal civic events, and so we expect it to be busier, and we're very hopeful for that. So uh, our teams are, are gearing up. Uh, I know uh, Mike joining us uh, new is really excited to see what this is all about. And, and frankly, our planning team, uh, myself included, really would have liked to have added to our geographic area this year. Um, you know, but as you can see from, uh, from this slide, the orange number showing our actual employees is far less than the last time we did a, a full state fair with more than three sites. Um, I think that as I said last year, it would be irresponsible to overpromise and underdeliver, and I think that it's even more heightened this year that uh, with even fewer operator resources, as great as everybody is and as hard as everyone is willing to work, uh, it wouldn't be setting us up for success, uh, both during the fair, but more importantly, as soon as the fair winds down and we need to return on the Monday after, or the Tuesday after Labor Day, 
uh, and be able to deliver 100% of our services, schools resume session and whatnot. So, um, so that's our plan for now. We feel really good about it. It's still gonna be a lot of hard work, um, but we're hoping to maybe be able to rebound in 23. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Adam. Great, right, thanks, Brian. I'm starting with a slide to follow up on Brian's information. And this is ridership by route category that shows our ridership on a daily basis from 2014 all the way to today. And so it will come as no surprise to people that we're much lower than we were in 2019. But there's a couple elements to this to point out. One is that on the local and LRT, which is the green and purple lines respectively, we are seeing an increase in ridership in both of those categories of the past year or so. So that's a positive trend. Um, and so we're gonna be coming back, hopefully closer towards where we were in 2019 and earlier, but we also know that we've got changing ridership patterns that we're developing even before 2019, as far back as 2014 on the local bus route network, as you can see gradual decline there. Uh, another point I'll make is that the blue line is commuter express route ridership. And of course, uh, we had 30,000 rides a day on our commuter express service back in 2019. And right now we have 3,000 rides a day. And that was a big component of our system serving the core downtown businesses of our region and a really important part of how we keep that market attractive and vibrant. Uh, so that's going to be an ongoing challenge as we've all experienced uh, the new type of work, working hybrid, working remotely. So we'll continue to work with our partners in the downtown communities and they help us understand where they're at as far as hiring goes, as far as on-site work and what kind of latitude they offer their employees. One of the smaller lines on this, just because of the scale is the red line and that's BRT. And it's actually been the most resilient across time that we've been operating. And we hope to continue to build on that model moving forward because we know our customers uh, enjoy and expect that reliable service and that good facility that we have and the offboard fare collection. So just a little bit of framing on where we've been and where we're at today as we think about how we wanna plan where our service goes and how frequently it operates. But to Brian's presentation, uh, we are short on operators and we're trying to stay ahead of the curve uh, we're coming off of summer where we have those lower service levels because the University of Minnesota and high schools are not uh, in service for us. So we're trying to maintain that same level of service throughout the summer and into the fall. So what that means is we need to make a few more trims to our regular route service in order to maintain that service reliability. Again, these are some uh, principles that you've seen before, but just want to reiterate them. Our goal is to maintain reliable service for everything that we've scheduled. So something that's scheduled is something that we deliver. People can find that on their phone, on the map, and certainly at the bus stop or rail station. So in order to balance that reliability with access, we're looking at identifying services that we might be able to make some adjustments to where customers have alternatives. Maybe they have a trip before or after the one we might be reducing, or they have an option for a car, or they can make that trip by making a transfer between a couple routes. So we're looking at ways that we can provide that continuity of access while adjusting our service levels. And a key part of this is making sure that we minimize the impacts to our ridership and we're balancing that with capacity. So you think about the ridership chart that we have and where we're at now, and I'll talk about this in a minute. We were at about 75% of our scheduled service to 2019, so we have a lot of capacity out there, even though our ridership as a system is about 55, 60%. So we're really trying to be careful about where we make these adjustments. We wanna maintain our frequent transit network. We define that as service that runs every 15 minutes on a select group of core routes and LRT. So we'll continue to do that. And we're evaluating all of our changes with an eye towards impact of our local communities as well. The image on the right just shows how many routes we have suspended. Many of these were continued from the beginning of the pandemic. You recall last December, we made a few more suspensions. And so out of the 164 routes that we operate along with contracted service from MTS, uh, 67 of them are suspended today. Most of those are commuter express routes. There are some 
supporting locals, but just to give you a sense of where we're at now, of course, we'd like to bring a number of these back and we'd like to bring a lot of frequency back too, but that's the state of where we are. So what that means for our changes coming up on August 20th in a couple of weeks is we're making reductions to the routes shown on this map where we're moving to a 15 minute frequency on a number of services, including LRT and A-Line uh, and a number of core locals like the Route 10 and 18 as well. So we have good frequency, it's a good network, but it's, a, it's an impact to our customers that we're not, uh, it's not our aim to do this. So what that means is it's about a, as a system, it's a one and a half percent reduction of bus service and 15% to light rail by going from every 12 minutes to every 15 minutes uh, on this scale. So when we roll this up cumulatively and we think about changes that we've made relative to workforce shortage over the past 12 months, these are the routes that have been most impacted based on where those resources have declined. And you look at this map and we've touched a lot of, a lot of routes. We've got the purple routes, which are suspended, the blue routes, which have seen frequency reductions one or two times. We've got the light blue routes, which have other schedule adjustments or span adjustments. Uh, the red lines on here are eliminations and replacements with orange line connecting bus service that happened again last December. So when you roll all this up, the workforce shortage has guided us towards about a 10.5% reduction in service hours for bus and 30% for LRT, remembering that we're at 10-minute frequency and that's where we want to be on LRT and now we're at 15-minute service. But it's not all gloom and doom because we have a great system and this is what our system is going to look like uh, after August and we continue to focus on those core communities where we know people depend on us for not just their work trip but for all kinds of trips and this system map looks very similar to what it has in previous years despite that we've made reductions up to 10 percent so we've got a strong core local network and we'll continue to protect that as we move forward in time. Here's a snapshot, again, by route class to give you some perspective on where the changes have been when we compare 2019 to 2022. So the gray bars are in 2019, the dark bars are fall 2022, and while we have an overall service complement that's 75% of what it was in 2019, again, we still have a strong core local network, that's that tallest bar and LRT and supporting local and the biggest impact has been to Commuter Express where we're really running about 30% of the trips that we had compared to 2019. Here's what this will look like for Commuter Express network. Uh, again, thinking about that ridership group that has the biggest significant change in terms of the downtown market and one of the things we would like to emphasize is that we do have good commuter express network that's anchored on large park and rides from each one of the primary freeway corridors and highway corridors into the downtowns. We're set to build on those as soon as we have operator resources. We'd like to add more frequency to those routes, uh, but we have a good network in place. And so this will be what that network looks like with the addition of the Route 467 that'll be serving the Lakeville Park and Ride as well. Then lastly, a uh, way to get all the information on these schedule changes is on our website. Everything is available as of today, full schedules. People can do their trip planning and make those connections and plan in advance how their travel patterns uh, can shape up. One of the bright spots is we've got our ongoing speed and reliability initiative for local service. And our new route for this year is Route 22, serving Brooklyn Center, Minneapolis, and Point South, where we're making some improvements to shelters and removing some bus stops. So that will improve the frequency of reliability on that route. And uh, one of the things that our customers have enjoyed on our previous efforts on routes like the Route 2 and 63 and 3 over the past couple of years. And then lastly, uh, with school coming up as well, we'll be adding some school trips back for University of Minnesota, Minneapolis Public Schools, uh, and St. Paul. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions.
Thanks to both of you. Uh, questions from council members, comments? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the issue of reliability is really critical, not just um, for today and someone wanting to um, board a, a transit and use it, but for our reputation. I mean, we need to be really careful about that because when you lose somebody, it's pretty hard to get them back and also they're sort of uh, a mouthpiece in a negative way. If, if So I appreciate that you're really sensitive to that and putting the word out uh, as many ways as you can that the, you know, the re reliability is first in, in, in our minds and that the time changes are minimal, but they impact people. But I think that's really an important consideration. Um, I have a question about the uh, money that is saved from the unpaid wages due to the, which we d wish we didn't have, but is that money that can then be used to pay bonuses and incentives and other things to attract additional drivers? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair and Councilmember Cummings. So um, I think so, and I'll, I'll let the general manager touch on this as well, but uh, whenever we, do have those savings that are not going, you know, we're not spending everything we have budgeted. We're absolutely looking at ways that that can be reinvested. And so um, I think as was touched on, you know, at a earlier transportation committee meeting, uh, many of it needs to, you know, end up being something that's bargained in partnership with the unions representing uh, employees. Uh, however, that's absolutely, you know, part of the discussions that we have continued to have. Yeah, Madam Chair and Councilman Cummings, uh, the only thing I'd add to that is that that it drops to the bottom line when at the end of the year when we have savings over the year and it's used at the discretion of the council and often through recommendation of uh, of, of uh, staff leadership uh, when that time. So it, it does drop to the bottom line. It's available for use, and uh, and the, and you know there's always demands on uses, but so it's generally available. Additional questions or comments? Madam Chair, just uh, one thing I'll, I'll add uh, is that uh, this council, uh, this committee members have been really good about helping to share with their networks the opportunities that we do have. And so uh, as we're continuing to recruit, uh, we will make sure that you're pr provided you know, with our latest information that we have, including um, you know, our twice monthly hiring events that are held at our instruction center across the street. Uh, those, uh, that location is also available for walk-in applicants every day of the week. Um, on weekdays, we can have staff there to be able to help people through. Uh, we also have a hiring event that's part of a, a larger event at the Mall of America uh, coming up very soon. And so we'll be able to share that. We'll have a presence uh, both for the operations staff as well as our technicians, um, where we also need um, staff who are looking to build a career with us. Um, I have one quick question. I think um, you kind of touched on it. I think last year there was an urgent need for us to fill in some um, supporting um, um, bus services when there was a lack of school bus drivers available. Um, and so I believe that was just in St. Paul. Apparently. Um, I assume that's factored in. Do we anticipate something like that happening again? And how could we, could we respond? Uh, Madam Chair, I think for the question, yes, we're able to help out St. Paul Public Schools for a select number of high schools to add past programs for their students. Uh, that's going to continue moving forward. Uh, we are challenged with a couple of those routes to have enough bus capacity and trip capacity for some of those schools, but we continue to work with them. And I think we've got a great working relationship and they've been supportive of our efforts and we're trying hard to meet their needs. Yeah, it's been, I think it's been a very cooperative effort. Everyone understood the need, both from their side and our side. So it was good we could work together. All right, uh, can I call any questions? I come from Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair, that it, you reminded me. Um, so we talked, whatever month or whatever, about that passes through to be given to every university student now as part of their um, student fees, which is a terrific program. What do you think that the impact will be on the system when university is back? Easy. Studentized. Well, Madam Chair, Councilmember Cummings, I can share, and then I'm sure Brian has thoughts on this too. Uh, Green Line is one of the primary modes that students take through the University of Minnesota, and I think we've got good capacity at some of those peak times, particularly in the earlier morning hours. 
and we'll have good capacity on the Route 3 and 2, which are running at every 15 minutes as well, but we'll certainly continue to monitor that and see what happens. Uh, our experience over the past five, uh, maybe not 10 years has been there's so much residential housing on campus that we actually see more students walking than taking transits from some of those locations. So hopefully those things will balance out and we'll get a little bit of a rebound and students will see that as an opportunity to take transit. Good, thanks. All right, just a final comment for you guys. I very much appreciate you coming and bringing and sharing all this information. Be very transparent about you know both the positive things that are happening and the negative things that we're having to adapt for. I think it really helps us as we're out talking to our communities to have this information. Um, and definitely click out the plea to all of you guys, just like I did. You know, get the word out to all your networks that. We have lots and lots of very high quality jobs available and lots of good place to get some great expertise. All right. Um, if there is nothing else for the committee, I'd entertain a motion to be to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Council Member Sterner. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Shambliss. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.